Thanks for being here. I appreciate everybody being here on time. We're going to do week three of the SLI uh, leadership and management training course. Really want to appreciate, uh, do appreciate everybody being here. I know that for you, uh, those of you who are on your day off, come in on a day like today, it's really a big sacrifice. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Hope to make this worth your while. So let's get right into it. Agenda today is we're going to review and discuss our homework. Review the principles, characteristics, and habits. We're going to have a leadership roundtable discussion on a few of those. Going to summarize what we learned, uh, look at homework assignment, and go on. So let's talk about it. Did everybody have a chance to write a book review summarizing the basic elements of the leadership book they wrote? Yes. They read? <coughs> who, who did that? I did, but I think I kind of misunderstood and wrote something a little bit different, but I did. With some characteristics of the book. Okay. All right. I do. Do. Can I get the print out? Here, here. Thank you. Where else do I need one? I wasn't here last one. Ah. Cool. Okay. So, did you get a chance to write a book review? If this was for week two, then, then no, but I remember week one's about like our characteristics that we we want to work on. Or did you did you come to the week two training? No, I did not. Okay, all right. So, uh, Kelly, why don't we start with you? Why don't you tell us a little bit about the book that you read and uh, what that means to you, what's good to you so far? Okay, the one that I'm reading, I haven't completely finished it. It is really large, but I've gotten mostly through it and the principles on it. This is what I was telling you about last week. That, um, so it's not, to, it's called The Wolf of Wall Street. It's not totally just a sales principle book, but the guy um, was a Wall Street broker and at 26 he was a millionaire. He's making a million dollars a week. He opened the world's largest boiler room. And it says he was based, boiler room the movie was based off of this guy. And uh, his method of sale though, he had one method and that's what he stuck to for like, that he would take guys and be like, if you follow this, you are going to make money. They would call people, it's called the straight line to persuasion. And it's a looping where you start off and then you let them speak. You ask guided or, excuse me, I guess, just um, direct questions to get them where you want them to go. Let them talk, find out their vulnerability, and then bring them back down and close it on them. <laughs> and so, like, you made them a ton of money. But the downside to it is, like, they would go out because they made so much money. And they would get hookers and they would do lots of drugs and they just party. And they would get raided, and they'd set up shop elsewhere. And but that that principle kept working you know, until they got caught and put in jail. And so, I don't know. It's kind of it's a sort of a what not to do, but how how effective this one method was for this particular era in the '90s or Wall Street. He probably had some very positive leadership uh, skills. Oh, obviously, people followed him everywhere he went. He was right. yeah, just a magnetic character. So. One of the things that happens in leadership is if you don't have a really uh, a well-defined moral compass, that, that that trip will find you off the path. And when you're off the path, uh, sometimes you don't have the ability to go find that path unless you have that moral compass from the bed of your chest. Mm -hmm. Then you get yourself in a lot of trouble. Even though you might have great leadership skills with lots of examples of people that uh, fall into temptation, take the easy route, maybe not have as much integrity as they'd like to have. Mm -hmm. They'll talk the integrity game, but don't do it. So yeah, he was probably, only 26 when he was doing this, so I'm sure his moral yeah. compass is still <laughs> Yeah, maturity is a, is a big thing. I, you know, I was chasing maturity for my entire 20s, you know. I never did quite catch it. Caught it in my 30s, you know, but it, it, maturity is maturity. So tell us about yours. Okay, so I'm reading What Back to Here Won't Beat You There. It's by Marshall Goldsman. It's a pretty good book. Um, he mainly the focus talking about managers, but he also uh, put, it, put it in an aspect where you can use it in your everyday life. Uh, he talks about stuff like uh, staying focused, uh, let's see, 
that state, how you need to stay uh, focused towards topics, um, changing your habits. For instance, uh, coming to work every day and just goofing off the first 15 minutes there and then trying to rush won't get you um, in a higher position. <coughs> and, uh, and then you also talk about uh, how managers use, uh, have ne negative habits of using uh, negative phrases such as uh, no, with negative sentences starting off with no, but, or how, or always making excuses. Uh, you know, it's just basically what he's talking about is uh, it's the way you approach people to make them uh, respect you more and, and want to do the right thing. So, what are you getting out of it? I'm getting out of it, out of it like, well, what I need to do is uh, analyze the way I approach a person about a situation before I actually just come out and, and say the first thing I'm going to talk about Analyze the situation first. Okay. <coughs> All right. And then, uh, of course, uh, it's an interesting, it's an interesting um, uh, point of view, concept, premise, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, you want to characterize that. What Jerry and I see is when we teach somebody something new or bring something new to somebody, we see an immediate increase in productivity. It's a funny thing, right? So any change whatsoever will, 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 will uh, give you an increase in productivity. For those of you who have gone through the training, right? You know, our secret success formula has the three buckets we talk about all the time. Now, what you discover is when you're trying to improve your sales performance, it could be managerial performance, it could be anything, but you have your attitude, activity, and then your skill sets, right? But what we know is if you make a change in any one of those three, you'll get a bump in your productivity, right? So, what the premise is. Hey, if whatever the behavior was that got you to here, it, it, it may not get you where you really want to go. So you either have to change your attitude, some sort of activity, focus different way, or change your skill set. What's interesting, all of these connect. All these are connected. All right? Having a good attitude helps you do your activity better, uh, setting goals, uh, achieving those goals helps inform your uh, attitude, which makes you do your activity better. As you have skill sets and get better and better and more confident, that affects your attitude. So it all affects your attitude, right? So it's really powerful. So that's a cool book. I'd like to read that. When you get through it, if I can borrow it from you, you can trust me, I'll get it back to you. How about you, sir? All right. The book that I'm reading called The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John Maxwell. Uh, it's a very practical book. Um, there are twenty one rules, obviously. He talks a lot about. He uses a lot of sports analogies uh, when he's talking about this stuff. But Give us some of the rules. Are they similar to the principles and characteristics we're talking bit. about? A little bit. Well, I'll, I'll tell you. Rule number one is the law of the lid, and what that is is that so that leadership is the ceiling of the organization. So if you have a really dynamic and good leader, you can build this. If the leader is kind of not very good. Okay. That's why when oh, when, it's a when, limiter. When it it's a limiter. It's an uh, organizational right. limiting factor. It, well, it yeah. could be. It can, you know, the, right. the organization is going to go as far as the leader will take. So that's why when companies make a change, they usually <clears throat> fire the guy in charge. You know, they don't fire them. Right. That's that's a good one. I like that one a lot. The other one is the law of E. F. Hutton, and that's when the leader speaks. You know, people tend to listen. Um, there's the law of the buy-in. Well, people buy into the leader before they buy into the vision. So you can try to sell the vision all you want, but if they're not buying you, they're not buying the vision. So I thought that was pretty good. Um, let's see what else we do. Uh, there is a uh, lot of priorities, which is something that I think Pamela likes a lot, which is that acti activity is not necessarily accomplishment. So uh. what, what, what's her big thing? It's uh, don't confuse. Uh, don't confuse try with results no, that's not, something like that. don't confuse activity with results yeah something like that it's like uh, don't no yeah don't confuse effort with results you know, it's because you're trying to do it um, but yeah it's, so there's 21 rules and, and they're all it's just real practical uh, it's really a nice way of uh, teaching the leadership principles, but if you look at the rules, right, just a few that you read, 
their principles are related to that. Oh, absolutely. No, right. I mean, all 21. Uh, yeah. I mean, they're, they're you can relate gold. principles to every it's one gold. of them. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's gold. So. Yeah, I'd like to read that when you're done with absolutely. that. I've read yeah, just several true. Maxwell's books, but I haven't, haven't read uh, yeah. read, read that one. There are a few of laws of leadership. Yeah, they, it, you know, we talk about the principles, right? And one of the principles is, uh, you know, know yourself and, and, and know your people and uh, effectively communicate, set an example. Right? Those are those are principles, right? Like you said, nobody's going to buy into your vision until they buy into you, right? So you have the greatest idea of me. Jerry and I yeah. talk about the four Marine Corps leadership principles, right? Which is mm -hmm. never sleep or eat before your people do. Mm -hmm. Never ask them to do anything you can or won't do. Always lead from the front and always be fair. If you do those four things, your people will buy into you. They'll buy into you and they'll buy into any vision you bring to them. I got an idea. We're going to attack a larger force <laughs> with no weapons. <laughs> All right, cool. Let's go, man. All right, that's fantastic. All right, who's got that? Who one more that I think is pretty good. It's the law of empowerment, and that's like that. only secure leaders give power to others. Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, that's it. That's it. What we find is when we start evaluating managers is that the people who don't have the ability to delegate limit their ability to be <coughs> right? You can't, you can't do everything in an organization. You have to have the ability to delegate, right? And still manage what you need to manage, but delegate some of those responsibilities to other people and then manage them, mm -hmm. right? Manage, manage those those things. All right, how about you? You want to tell us about your book? Yeah, I'm reading a book that's stories in this book, and it's called The Leadership Moment, Nine True Stories of Triumph and Disaster and Their Lessons for Us All by Michael Epstein. Cool. And I kind of chose this book because one of the reviews said that it's not direct to the point, it's not boring, and it's stories that are just going to sit in the back of your head, and when you're faced with an instance where you would need to use one of these leadership ideas, you have it in the back of your mind. So that's right. why I chose the book. Um, but I'm reading the first story, and it's a story about a guy named Roy Vagalos, who was the chairman of Merkin Company Pharmaceuticals, who created some drug to get rid of river blindness. It's a parasite that grows in your body and eventually you'll go blind. So they created this drug and then decided that there is no use for this drug because the only people with that disease live in third world countries. And he decided to make this drug a free drug and pass it out to them and go treat their water and everything around them to kill all these flies that are carrying the parasites when all of his investors said that he couldn't do it. There's no point in doing that. You just wasted millions and millions of dollars. So he made the right decisions. He had good judgment. And they now have a program. It's called Mechtizen and Donation Program. And you donate so these third world countries can get these drugs. And they are like the leading <coughs> number one pharmaceutical company in Japan because he chose to sacrifice and get these things out and do the right thing and lead people to help people. One, so, of, the story, one of the stories is about Joshua Chamberlain. Yeah. Josh Lawrence Chamberlain's amazing character in history. He changed United States history. One guy changed United States history. Pretty remarkable. Fantastic. How about you, Travis? Did you get a chance to read a book and write a book review on it? Yeah, um, well, it's just finishing the How to Win Friends and Influence People. Um, so, a couple things I liked they talked about is, um, well, as far as leadership goes, you know, they say, you know, they're saying 15% of being a good leader is your knowledge, and 85% is the ability to express ideas, assume leadership, and arouse enthusiasm in people, which, you know, you know shows me you don't have to be the smartest guy in the world or anything. You don't have to know everything. You just have to know, you know the direction you want to go and you know, where you want to be at the end. Uh, you know, they talk about different techniques to handle people without making them feel like they're being manipulated. Uh, I've definitely had you know, managers, leaders, whatever you want to call it in the past, who you know when they're just manipulating you to get what they want, right? And I think once you know that that's what they're doing, then you don't, you don't want to help them, even if it's the right direction. If you feel like they're just in it for themselves and they're using you, I mean, I always lose respect real quick for those people. But if I feel like they're generally on the side and we're both trying to get to the same goal, then you know, they may be manipulating me or not, but you know, if I at least believe in what they're saying, then I'm more likely to follow them. Uh, also, you need to you know, arouse the eager to want. 
put that one in quotes for some reason because you know it's you can tell somebody you have to do something and they'll do it, but unless they really feel like they want to do it, they have that urge for themselves to kind of jump out and do it. You know, that's something that kind of stuck with me. Um, one thing that this book talked about that Jerry does all the time is uh, you want to let the other person feel like the idea. If you have a good idea, it's their idea. Um, he does that all the time. Um, also, you want to talk about your own mistakes before criticizing somebody. Um, you know, you never want to just pull somebody in and beat down on them or talk about you know how bad they are. You know, want to you know, eat it, eat it, be without shame, catch the first stone, but yeah, right? yeah. And it's it's weird. This whole book is basically telling you to you know almost beat up on yourself, you know, to let other people know that you're more human, that you, you know, you're not perfect, you're not claiming to be perfect. Um, but to get somebody on your side, you know, you almost have to, it's like in sales, you want to position, if you say something bad, you want to say something good, and then bad, and good, you know, kind of you know, swap it around, so. Overall, I, I love this book. I mean, it's something everybody should read. You know, it's one of the classics. You say he's one years old. And there's two uh, real important principles to weave through the book. One is reciprocity. Right? You treat mm -hmm. people like you would be treated, and they have more of a tendency to treat you that way. You treat somebody with disrespect, or get disrespect back. Treat somebody with respect, get respect back, right? Yeah, and the other one is enlightened self-interest. Ever heard that phrase? Enlightened self-interest. If you can make somebody understand that some sort of behavior, change in their behavior, is in their best interest, and they have an aha moment, they go, oh yes, I see that. I do see that. I see that doing that particular thing is best for me. That's called enlightened self-interest, and they'll do it because it's in their best interest to do it. Not because you told them to do it, but because they realize it's in their best interest. It's, it's a management principle in communication. It's not a leadership principle, it's a management principle, right? It's always try to cast it in the form of enlightened self-interest. Let me share with you why I think you ought to consider this, right? This is what it does for you. It's like selling benefits. This is what it does for you, this is what it does for you, this is what it does for you, this is what it does for you. Does for you. Mm -hmm. right? When Jerry and I are coaching, you hear us do it all the time. Do you know? We, we, we sort of couch it in those terms, right? Who else wants to talk about a book? Anybody? Okay. Okay. We're just going to let this go right this second. But what I want you to do is identify another book. Get through the ones that you are are looking at. And, uh, and we're going to continue this discussion. Okay? Team leadership in the workplace. Anybody Google that? Mm-hmm. Um, real quick, so I have a theory I was talking to Doug about earlier. Is this something Jerry came up with so he can get more hits on his website? <laughs> I'm surprised he didn't say YouTube this specific phrase. Who would have let me? Oh, okay. All right. I just had to ask him. Uh, I, I did. Um, and thanks for clicking on all of those clicks for me. Yeah, sure. You kill them. Um, but there's a, 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 a team with an ineffective leader who is sort of like a, a ship without a rudder. There's, there's no direction and uh, but, um, yeah, so if, if, you, if you have a team, as I just said, that doesn't have any kind of uh, bad leadership. And have a team that does what they want. Mm -hmm. Any, anybody else uh, Google? Uh, mine is a lot like Doug's book that core values and integrity are really what lead the team and they influence and impact every other aspect of leadership because that's the foundation, kind of like the foundation of a building. And the, the different qualities that they say that this affects as far as leadership goes are the stability of your people, knowing not having them leave or, you know, you keep them there. And then safety, and safety not so much that their physical safety, but to allow people to have freedom right. while also, you know, keeping them, or using their talents properly. Right, right. Okay, and then... Focus and engage, but freedom to say the things that they feel like they need to say. Exactly, and to express themselves. Right, within the, within the framework of uh, productive Team. Well, sure, yeah, yes. exactly. And then um, reference is the third one, and that is uh, like 
kind of a, a measuring stick or a checking point. It's somewhere we can always have you know, a meter to go off of, a baseline, I guess, if you will. And then um, I think that those are the only three that they really go into. One of the key questions you always ask yourself as a manager, no matter what it is you're doing, is how do we know, how do we know we're going to be successful? How do we know when we're successful? How do, how do you define it? success, right? And, and, and you have to have a baseline to start where you start. So let's look at Doug's premise for a second, okay? All right. Um, you've heard the phrase, uh, nature abhors a vacuum, right? And what that means in nature is that typically if you see a vacuum, right, you don't necessarily see life in there, right? It's not, it's not able to exist in there. Also, what it means is that nature will be nature and take over anything, like the Mayan temples, you know, that they now found a temple in Belzea or someplace. Belize. But not not Belize, it's uh, over in the, uh, in the former Soviet. Oh, Belarus? No, it's, it's, it's one of the B words, but uh, Bulgaria, so one of those places anyway, and, and, they, and, and they thought it was a mountain for years and years and years, and they discovered it's a temple. It's, a, it's, a, it's like a pyramid. And uh, nature had just grown all, 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 all over. But in leadership, what they've done, they've done study after study after study after study, where they take people in a controlled situation, and they, they deliberately uh, uh, don't allow leadership to take place. And then they kind of measure people's uh, feelings about that particular situation. And there's high levels of anxiety yeah. involved with not being able to have a leader. And so what happens when those groups is that the instant that either in, internally they develop a leadership structure or it's externally uh, forced on them, right, they instantly feel better about what they're doing and their anxiety drops off dramatically. So what that tells us is that leadership really does make a big difference. And somebody talked about uh, John Maxwell's book about the uh, being a lid on an organization, right? Um, an organization will only go as far as the leadership can take it. And it takes a mature leader to step back and say, you know what? This is beyond my ability to do. I'm going to take my baby and give it to somebody who's got a better skill, skill set than I do. And people have done it. Bill Gates did it. I mean, tons of people have done it to see their companies grow tremendously with somebody who's got a bigger, better, better skill set. What's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I wrote something down um, from Google that said, ignorance of team members' skill sets causes the teams to become dysfunctional. So I guess knowing, you know, putting somebody who's not good at a certain job, you know, not a good idea, and giving somebody a job that they're too good for is a bad idea. So. Yeah, the overqualified over thing becomes an issue. It becomes a tension point in uh, in organization. I would tell you, frankly, you have to do it from time to time because mm -hmm. you have to do it. But it's always better to match the job requirements to the person as best you possibly can. You always get better results when you have a good match, right? Sometimes you have an overqualified <coughs> person taking over. You usually have to shape that in a way that that overqualified person know they know that it's a temporary position or that's limited in some sort of form or function. Uh, let's review leadership, right? Kelly, read this for us, please. Leadership is the ability to lead, the ability to guide, direct, or influence people. Okay, what does it take to be a leader? <laughs> Principles, but which inform the 21 laws. Characteristics that we model, right? You have to buy into that person before you buy their vision. Habits. Leadership habits are like anything else. They're good, you know, good like good healthy habits or or, or or help grow leaders. Behaviors that people can see. Leadership principles. A blind law or assumption required in the system of thought. Let's read that, Travis. Um, the whole thing? No, the second one. Okay. <laughs> the principles have been proven over time that when followed produce effective leaders. Okay. Roadmap, right? You got to go out to the West Coast. You're going to the West Coast. Why would you go northeast for 400 miles, go north northwest for 400 miles, go northwest for 200 miles, go north northwest again for 200 miles, go northwest west 
for 200 miles and then go west. Why would you do that? Well, it makes no sense whatsoever, yeah, right? Emotion. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Why not take a look at the map and say, okay, I'm going to drive on I-10 to El Paso. El Paso out to San Diego, all right? I'm going to spend the night in El Paso, right? It's a road map. Right? Why not follow the already existing road map? Hey, Jerry, let's go to San Diego, but let's not go on any paved roads, <laughs> right? No. Can't use any sure. paved roads, right? We're going to be hopping fences, right? <laughs> Cutting fences, Jerry and I riding a motorcycle over ranches or something, getting shot at, all that kind of stuff, right? Apply to businesses, or an organization, or to sports teams. <laughs> 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 Oh my gosh. God awful. So, so, so uh, Kelly said some uh, real, really important uh, a, a minute ago, and that is that really leadership comes from core values that are internal. Right? It's, it comes out of here. Right? People can tell if you're authentic, if you care about them, if you respect them. It comes out of here. Right? So you have to develop that. Make sense? Know yourself and seek improvement. We talked about that last week. Know your business, your products, your services. You need to more know more about your business than the people that work for you. Yeah. Right? You got to know your employees' strengths and weaknesses and make their success your priority. How do you do that? That's by getting to know you gotta, them. You got to yeah, you got to get right in the trench with them. You got to get to know them. You have to understand. You have to observe them. <laughs> right? One thing you'll notice about Jerry, he's an observant guy. Constantly, his radar is on Rome all the time, right? Keep your employees and staff team informed. Yeah, does that ever become an issue? Yes. Yeah. Communication. Oh, yeah. It does, right? I've been guilty of not being very good at that. Right. It, none of us enjoy that, right? Oh, we've got a meeting in 10 minutes. One meeting. Right? Oh, we have to be prepared with four different things. Okay. <laughs> what are the four things? Why come nobody told me that? Well, come on, participate anyway, and you feel awful. Because you're in there and everybody's done their homework, everybody's ready to go, and you haven't done anything. Set the example. <clears throat> Show the task understood, cigar is completed. Train your people as a team. Make sound and timely decisions. Develop a sense of responsibility. Employ your people in accordance with their capabilities. Seek responsibility and take responsibility for your actions. Your characteristics, justice, fairness. Right? We've talked about this over and over. Judgment, dependability, initiative, decisiveness, tact, integrity, characteristics, enthusiasm, bearing, unselfishness, courage, knowledge, loyalty, and endurance. Emotional intelligence. Stronger personal relationship skill set. You know, being aware of how other people feel. Being aware of body language. As a trainer, I am constantly looking at body language, whether somebody's engaged or not engaged, right? Whether they're buying into what I'm selling or they're not, right? It's really hard for me. I don't care. So that's something that I'm having to start to yeah. have people feel because I really don't care. So I'm having to like pay more attention and say, okay, let me realize how they feel to try to remember that. You know, a really good question, and you probably have already answered this for yourself, is uh, why, why, why are you in a, in a state where you don't care? That's probably a good question. It goes back to know yourself, kind of understand that, that part of it, you know? Empathetic listeners, general empathy. Trying to inspire and motivate. Talked about this last week. Be proactive, right? Begin with the end result in mind. <coughs> but first things first. Think win-win. Seek first to understand, then be understood. Synergize, right? This is the wisdom of crowds. Kelly <laughs> may be really, really, really smart, right? She may be really smart, and she's given a problem, and she probably can solve the problem. But if she adds you to her team, who has a different way of looking at things, and adds him to the team, who has a real different way of looking at things, and adds Jerry to the team, adds Doug to the team, all of a sudden you have a a wisdom of crowds, of vast experiences, different points of view. And where her idea would have worked, would have been perfect, you ask her a real simple question. Well, what if we do this? And she looks at you like you've lost your mind. She goes, yeah. Yeah, because 
I didn't think of that. I thought of everything else, but that makes it better. Right? That solution makes it better. Then he says, well, what if we do this? Then all of a sudden you have a much better plan and a much better solution than a single person. There are people entirely capable of solving problems, but it's much better if you solve problems in a synergistic way by using all the points of view and all the perspectives and all the energy and wisdom that's collective in a room, right? Remember, the leadership is doing the right things. Management is doing things right. And leader managers do right things right. Okay? Round table discussion. Set the example. Callie, I'm picking on you because you stole my dress today. Okay. okay. Fair <laughs> Tell me, why is this considered a leadership principle? And how might you see this principle in the workplace? Can you give me an example of setting an example and how that might work? within an organization like this. Okay, well, why it's considered a leadership principle is because, and we've been building on this all three weeks so far, is if people see what you're doing, and you're doing things the right way and you're willing to do those things, then they're going to follow that and they're going to have the right way to do it shown to them and that, then there's no excuse and you've covered all your bases. An example of this would be we're out on the floor and Doug or Simon, um, there's, you know, five in queue and nobody can get off of a call and they get on the phones and start taking over because they're trying to help not drop a bunch of calls. And then people see that and they're like, okay, well, I'm not going to get up and go to the restroom right now. I'm not going to take a break right now because they're on the phone. So. Very good, very good. <laughs> Simple. Doug, why is this? The principle was critical. Well, I mean, you're, you're, you're trying to set a standard. Uh, if um, you know, if, if your team sees you playing around uh, on ESPN.com, checking out the fantasy football team, you know what's going to keep them from getting on Facebook? It's just, it's just setting the expectation. I mean, you no know we're not allowed to do this, but what you do all the time, right? So I know you're right. doing it, so I'm doing it. So it's a big deal. You know, so that's, you've got to lead by example. No, so. we, we talk about the roadmap and how important and critical that is, right? In essence, leaders are roadmaps, right? You can, a, a leader is somebody who says, do what I do, right? not do what I say, do what I do. If you have somebody that says, do what I say, because I know what I'm talking about, and then they don't do what they say to do, there's no validity there. It's not, it's, you, you don't consider that valid. You don't consider that valid. You're right. You don't believe it, right? You know? And so your, your willingness to do that falls, uh, falls off. Set the example, brother. Why, why is this a, a important principle? How do you see that working in an organization like this? I think it's important just because um, there's there's something good about like a happy heart. And like if you set the example and, like what you would do on the inside with your core values and people would see that. Like and how that would relate to business like this is like when you're <clears throat> when you're interacting with people as I mean I guess as supervisors, you know, just walking the lanes and talking to people, you know, happy smile and you know, talking about their goals. It's just like you know, it's like you care about them and it, it should transcend to you caring about who you talk to as far as the customer. But then it just turn right back to them, how you treat them and how when they talk to you about numbers, things are gonna work out. It's like you know, it's like you believe in each other with the example set that you have trust. I think that's that's a very specific case about setting an example, but I know it's very important how you do that with you interacting with coworkers. Okay, Steve, give us an example of setting a good example on the floor. Okay, uh, for instance, uh, I like to set an example by, uh, we deal with people credit cards all the time, so I don't never write none of that information down. I try to set an example. Whenever I'm helping a new person out, I try to teach them it's best to use a notepad or the little sticky notes or whatever, because that's the very crucial information that can hurt the company. If the company hurt, then I won't have done. <laughs> Fine. 
But so that, we just had an example of enlightened self-interest, right? You're doing the right thing with enlightened self-interest because you know that if you do the wrong thing, that one of the things that could happen is the company could go south and you wouldn't have a job. Or they could catch you doing the wrong thing and you not have a, a, a job, right? So set, set an example, buddy. Give us, give us uh, how that might work on the floor. Oh, when things are go <clears throat> things are going hectic, you know, don't lose your cool, because these agents, you lose your cool, you know, they're going to get frustrated and all that. Okay. If you lose your cool with them, then maybe they believe they can lose their cool with the customer. Right. I set an example the wrong way, right? What you, sir? I would say, you know, lead by example. Um, Stand in the seat, being available, being ready, showing up on time. Uh, you know, people they tend to say, "Well, man, how do you make so many sales?" Oh, I mean, it, it, it's one of the things that I do when I stay in my seat. You know, I, I be available to take the calls. So I, I think that would fit right into the category of leading by example because uh, this is what needs to be done in order to do the job effectively. Can, can I add something? Sure. I haven't been the best of messaging this, but the number one part of priority of this company, number one, is answer the phone. Right. If you're not answering the phone, what are you doing here? You know, you're making money. What are you doing? I mean, so anyway, but yeah, I appreciate you for exactly what you just said, because that is that's why we like perfect. It. It, it's only happened three times since I've been here, but Jerry, uh, um, yeah, a lot of people come to Jerry for advice and counsel or to complain. Wine and moan. And uh, somebody uh, would come to him and say, I'm not making uh, enough money. So Jerry, pretty patient with them, takes them through a little exercise of why they're not making more money and they start looking at their availability. He puts the availability and they're available 50% of the time, right? And he says, I think I, I think we I think we fixed your problem, right? But it, how about twice the money? What, what would you do with twice the money? You know, the, then they kind of stammer and stutter and kind of walk out, you know, because that wasn't what they wanted to hear, right? They didn't want to hear what they had to do. They wanted to hear what you were going to do for them, right? That's pretty amazing, pretty dog and lot amazing. How about you? Why, why is that the example so important? It's important because you want, I don't know, you don't want everyone to be doing what they want to do. They're at work to work. And if you're at work setting that example to work, do it right, be responsible, be mature, then other people are just going to follow in that lead. You're going to have a bunch of kids playing around at work, or you can have a bunch of adults sitting down doing the job, making their company money, making their company successful. So I think it's important for you to lead the way you want other people to act and do and have and do their job. Okay. Years and years and uh, years ago when I was in the service, uh, we had what called, was called a regimental Olympics. Did you ever go through one of those? And they have uh, rifle things and swimming and all kinds of different things that, that you compete in and you get points and you're trying to get the top regiment. And one of those things was supposed to be a 25 mile hike. But uh, Camp Pendleton, right on the coast there, there's a lot of elevation changes, right? A lot of mountains and stuff. So what they call the S3 in the battalion laid a, a, a protractor on a map and measured the, the, the distance between this peak and that peak. And, and he said it was 25 miles, right? Well, I've, I've been doing this a long time. And I looked at it and I went, okay, if you're flying, it's 25 miles. <laughs> but if you're walking, you got to go downhill and uphill and downhill and uphill. And I don't know about you guys, but that's distance. And I said, I said to that guy, I said, it's got to be 40 something miles. So it ended up being 43 miles, right? And it was supposed to be a 25 mile hike. So anyway, we went on this 25 mile hike and we had this uh, major who was a pretty, uh, pretty old guy for, for major. He'd probably been major a very long, long time. Probably 10, 10 years, which is a long time to be a major. He should have been with Lieutenant Colonel a long time ago. But he was a leader. The guy was a leader. And then we had the uh, battalion commander. And I liked him a lot. His name was Colonel Beerman. He was a really nice guy. And I'll never forget this. The major marched 43 miles, and the colonel rode the jeep. And I have never been able to get that out of my head. That's been 
forever ago, and I still remember that. The colonel rode the jeep, right? And the major walked every step with us. And after that, I thought more of the major than I ever thought of the colonel. Because we had to go on this stupid 25-mile hike that was 43 miles long, <laughs> right? Just about ruined the whole battalion, right? Everybody just you know, carried any kind of packs. And the colonel rode in the jeep all night long. He set the, he set the wrong example, right? He didn't. He, or he didn't let you be 48 in the face. That's exactly right. He rode that damn G. Right? <laughs> and it just irritated him. It, just, it, it really uh, undercut his leadership. And about six weeks later, they put another gun in. And I think part of it was he lost the, tr the trust uh, in, of his officers, you know. We're going to go on a 25-mile hike. Well, it's not 25 miles, it's 43. Okay, well, whatever. But you guys go, and I'll ride the Jeep. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. Well, it's not we, that's you. Yeah. So here's what I'll say about setting the example, right? It's a challenge every single day for you to come in and set the example in whatever you do, right? We always say in the organization that when we get ready to promote somebody, <coughs> we already know who that leader is because they act like a leader, they walk like a leader, they talk like a leader, they do leadership things, right? If you want a duck, what do you want? You want a you want a you want a mongoose or you want a duck? If you've decided you need a duck, right? A duck quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, looks like a duck, right? You got a mongoose. They're pretty cool, kill snakes and stuff. <laughs> but that's not what you're looking for. So you got this wild mongoose over here going, I want to be a duck. I want to be a duck. And you're going, I don't think so. And then you got a guy over here that walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, acts like a duck, thinks like a duck, looks like a duck. There you go, that's a duck. So when we're getting ready to promote a duck, who are we going to promote? Mongoose who kills snakes, crazy person, or a duck? We're going to promote the daggum duck, right? So we have to come in every single day and we have to be leaders. And we have to be on time, and we have to know our stuff, we have to sit there and do what we need to do, constantly improve ourselves, uh, speak to attack to everybody, really be a leader in everything we do. Roundtable discussion. What do these terms mean? Why are these characteristics important? And how do you see them being modeled or displayed in the workplace? Callie? Initiative. All right, initiative is the drive to do it, get it done. Um, it's like proactive. I mean, it's a synonym for proactivity, right? Yes, and Okay, uh, taking initiative, if there, I mean, with anything, if there's something that needs to be done, you just getting up and doing it, even if it's not your responsibility, just stand up and take care of it and don't say anything about it and sit down and go back to your work and you'll see that. Dr. Weaver? That is one of Trey's strengths. When That's she's true. done with her stuff, she will come around to all of us. Is there anything you need help with? Is there anything I can help you with? Um, if there's something you don't you, you, you need to get done tomorrow, I can do it for you today. She's always looking for more ways to help everybody. That's an issue. I walked down the floor about two weeks ago, and uh, all the leadership <coughs> was, was in a meeting. Everybody was in a meeting. And everybody on the floor was chit-chatting, just having a good time chit-chatting. Nobody's on the phone. They're going, okay, this is weird. So I asked somebody, I said, what, what happened? And somebody said, uh, we don't have access to the cable portal, and we don't have access to something else. I said, has anybody told anybody? And they said, nobody's here. And I thought to myself, wow, that's crazy. <coughs> and so you know what they were doing? They were chit-chatting on the floor. Well, somebody needed to stand up and go, you know what? Brew's in there. Jerry's in there. Somebody's in there. Knock on the door, cable portal's down, something's down, telephone system's down, we can't do what we need to do. Jerry jumps up like a rocket when something like that happens, and he disappears from the room, right? He's gone, and he's down wherever he needs to be getting that turned back on. But somebody took initiative on the sales floor to make sure that he knew about it. So that's one example of initiative. Decisiveness, what does that mean as a leader, manager? And you'll be, you'll be quick to decide like what you got to do when you're... Like 
especially as a manager, when you're just getting bombarded with like, hey, what's this? Like, I don't even know if it's Earthling or Dish, like whatever it's going to be. So just be quick and, and like soft-spoken with them and help people. You'll be, you'll be pretty smart so that you don't have any, any, uh, any way of defense towards who you're working with. And why is that a leadership characteristic? Why is that something that leaders model? You have to be effective. You can't just take time and say, okay, well, he's already talking about the car. Okay, let's, let's think about this. What's your last name? It's like you got to be right to the point. I mean, it's, to be effective is you're just making business go. If money, if people are making money, then you're just, you're just gaining trust because you already know your stuff and you put trust in them already. To a certain extent, this is not completely true, but to a certain extent, uh, decisiveness. I just lost my thoughts here. <laughs> Decisiveness also means, uh, guys, that when you when you make a decision, you stick, stick to it. Okay, because sometimes, you know, when things are going wrong and you're trying to change something, and then you go, oh, uh, it's not changing. Maybe I made a mistake. Uh, yeah. I, I, I need to do this different, right? You're not sticking with your original thing to see if it works. We all do it. Whether we do it on the phone, what we do in our personal lives, we all do the same, the same thing. I got my thought back. Decisiveness is a byproduct of really two things, right? One is your knowledge, right? If you don't know, it's hard to make a decision about something, right? So the more you know as a leader, the easier it is for you to reach into that file and pull that out. The other thing that decisiveness comes from is from a formal sort of decision-making process that you've gone through with yourself where you really take yourself quickly through the process. What you know, what are, the, what are the pros, what are the cons, what's that going to mean, how's that going to impact the organization, what's that going to mean in five years, is this an important decision, an unimportant decision, is this something that's, that, that's, that's going to make a, uh, a positive impact on this person in the organization, to make a negative impact, whether, you know, sort of teach yourself that, right? And then you know your stuff, you sort of combine those things together and you go, you know what, here's what we need to do, right? And people respect that. They respect that decisiveness, right? What they teach us in the Marine Corps is make a damn decision, right? <laughs> right, wrong, or indifferent, make a decision, right? They teach us that from day one. Make a decision, Lieutenant, make a decision. You know, jump off the cliff, don't jump off the cliff. Make a decision, right? And so it trains you to think quickly in terms of, okay, if I jump off the cliff, it's not going to be a good thing, you know? What are the alternatives? What can I do? That's sort something, of right? Uh, tack. What does tack mean, guys? What does tack mean? I honestly cannot remember what that means, and I thought I had it written down, and I don't. The I way you handle things? The way you say things. Yeah. Jerry, you're a worthless, no good SOB, and I hate working with you. Know, well, I was going to say, I don't have no tack. Why are you asking me? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, how you, it's how you say things, right? Uh, what you might say to somebody is, instead of saying to somebody, uh, you're lazy. <laughs> You are lazy. You're a lazy person, right? <laughs> you don't say that. You say it a little differently. You say, you know, I've observed that um, there are a lot of moments in your day when you're not really doing the activities that will help you make money. What, what, what can you tell me about that, right? Th that's totally different than you're lazy, right? Because when you accuse somebody of something, what happens? Right. If I get up in your face, Stephen, and point my finger, right? What's going to happen? You'll probably do something. You'll probably do something. What will happen is both of us have testosterone poisoning. All of us do. The guys do. The women don't. But, but language is powerful, right? And when you start poking somebody, they're going to poke back up at you. Right? And so there's nicer ways of saying things, right? Sometimes I, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. It's how you say it, right? And I always sandwich it, right? I always build a little sandwich when I'm talking to people. I might say something like, you know what, I have noticed that you are really, really, really exceptionally good at exceed sales. And, and I really would like for you to share with me how you're able to do that. Uh, by the way, <laughs> what I've also noticed that your dish sales are not where they need to be, and we need to discuss that. So, based on that, what I'd like to do is create a plan for you to be able to move forward and do better dish sales. So let's talk about the seed sales. Why are you able to do that? And let's see if we can transfer some of that over to the dish sales. 
you see how you do that? It's just instead of, you could sell a dish if you gave it away, you know? It's how you say it. It's not what you say, it's how you say it, right? Make sense? So is tact important? Why is tact important? Why is tact important? It's just the way that you approach it. I mean, you're going to keep the respect for the people that you're meeting if you approach them in a tactful manner. I mean, you know. If you say things a certain way to someone, they're going to shut down. Yeah, they are. They're going to completely not hear a word you're saying. They're, they they don't care. That shield's going to go up, and you're going to get nowhere. That's right. The veil of silence comes over. Right? Yeah. They're not listening. They're they're checked out. We have a little uh, thing uh, with uh, one of the characters from uh, Family Guy, uh, the little Stewie. kid, Stewie. Stewie. Stewie, Stewie says, uh, "I stopped listening five minutes ago. I don't know why you're still talking." <laughs> right? <laughs> you know? All right. So I will tell you, as I older I get, the more I realize how important this term is. I think this is the most important term that anybody ever deals with as a manager or leader. And I think that all good leadership and all good management comes from this. If you're respectful of the people that you're dealing with, regardless of their educational background, their ethnic background, where they come from, what their role is in the, in the, in the, in the, in the organization, it doesn't matter, right? They're as good as you are. You may make more money than they do, but it just doesn't matter. They're still a good people. They're still good people, and they got good thoughts. And so, if you always come out of respect, you, you, you pretty much can't get in trouble, right? And tact is informed through this, and all things leadership are informed through this. If you respect the people that you're dealing with, and what's interesting, like everything leadership, all things leadership, it comes from inside. You have to respect yourself too, right? Good leaders are not people who have huge amounts of internal issues and problems, right? They're, they're, they're people who have worked through those internal problems and issues, and they respect themselves, and they treat themselves respectfully, right? They, they, they eat correctly. They, they do the things they need to do to maintain what, what, what God gave them, you know? It's, it's just it, the respect for yourself, respect for others, sort of emanates out and makes you a better leader manager. You buy that? Does that make sense? Think about that. Am I right or wrong? What do you think? Mm -hmm. you, what do you think? Yeah, I think you're right. What do you think, Kelly? I'll know you're right. Why not? Right. Okay. Habits. Begin with the end in mind. Okay? This is a, <clears throat> a little bit of a leadership thing, but it's more of a management thing, right? <clears throat> Uh, what do you think that means? Begin with the end of mind. We got about six minutes. Oh, think about the, the, the consequences before you do it, before you actually uh, make the action. Yeah, think about the results you need, right? What, what, what are you looking to? What are you looking to have? Like, what what do you expect this to look like, right? What what what, what it, you're going to create something? What is it we're going to create? What's it going to look like, right? We're going to create an organization. Okay, what's the organization going to look like? We're going to create a sales plan, okay? What do we expect that sales plan to be able to do? When Jerry and I sat down to write the, the sales training plan, the very first thing we did was write down what we wanted in terms of object objectives, right? What, what, what do you want that person to have in terms of knowledge or skill set after two weeks, right? And you say, okay, I want them to be able to take an inbound sales call. I want them to be able to sell dish, to sell direct. Or to be able to handle an objection, to be able to develop rapport, to be able to position products, right? So you write those down, and then you work back from that to develop a plan that will accomplish that. So you always want to begin with the end result in mind. Like when you sit down with me and, and meet with me as a consultant, the first thing out of my mouth is always, Callie, what would you like to accomplish in this hour? It's always that, right? Because they're paying me for the hour. What would you like to accomplish in this hour? What, 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 what would you like to see at the end of the, at the, end of the hour? <coughs> I start every conversation as a consultant that way. And the reason I do is because I went through this class 20 years ago. And I, and, I, and I know how valuable it is. Why would this be valuable as a leader? It's vision, isn't it? 
this division. It's sort of like the, do the domino thing where, you know, this the action that you take here, you got to know how it's going to affect the chain down the line. Exactly. You, know, you have to understand what these actions that you're taking right now, how that's going to affect you know, where you're trying to go. You always start with the vision, always start with the uh, result in mind, right? <coughs> right? You have to think it through as a leader. Think about that, right? Let's everybody come to work today, great, right? But at the end of the work today, what we need to accomplish is we need to have 45 dish cells. We need to have so many direct cells. We need to have so many new cells, so many wild blue cells, so many this cell, right? How do we get to that element? Who's on deck today? How do we take this group of people and get to those goals? Right? You have to think your way through it, right? We didn't get that done yesterday. What do I have to do differently today to get that done, right? So it makes you think about what you're doing differently than just coming in and going to work. So whatever you do, you always start with the end result in mind before you start, right? Think about that. And it forces you to go through an exercise where you logically go through it to the point where you may change what the results you're looking for, but you, you're going you're to develop a plan uh, that will get you where you need to go. Does that make sense or not? Can you see why that's important? Right? And uh, I love uh, my grandkids are coming over this weekend, and we're probably going to watch uh, uh, Nemo, right? Lo lo I love that. And I love Dory, right? <laughs> I love Dory. My favorite character, Ellen DeGeneres, right? And he says, we're going to find Dory. Oh, 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 follow me, follow me. And she runs off. She's going, she's going like crazy. She's following behind her. She looks around and goes, why are you following me? Who are you? Who are you? <laughs> you know, it doesn't give you a lot of confidence when the leader doesn't know where the leader's going, right? So a leader needs to know where the hell they're going and what that needs to look like before they get started. Does that make sense? What do you think? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, summary. We keep learning the principles, characteristics, and habits. And, you know, and like we said earlier, there's 10,000 ways of doing this, right? The 21 irrefutable laws, right? But I guarantee you these principles inform those laws. Mm -hmm. Okay? And we talked about and began to talk about it. it, it here, here's my purpose in this, guys. I am hopeful that I will inspire you guys to want to be leaders and managers. And I will inspire you to look at yourself in an honest, objective way and then develop a plan for yourself to be the leader and manager you'd like to be. That, that's really what this is all about. Because <clears throat> right? not only are these... Uh, business lessons, but these are life lessons, right? Leadership does not stop when you get in your car tonight. Leadership goes into the home. For those of us who have experienced the joys of being parents, which, you know, I don't know if joy is the right word, then maybe occasionally joy, right? But those of us who have experienced parenthood realize that we do have important positions of leadership in our family. Right? Good or bad. We lead our families. And sometimes, unfortunately, we lead our families in the wrong way. So hopefully this will inform us in ways in which we can be better leaders, better fathers, better husbands, better mothers, better, better everything, right? Does it make sense? Okay. All right, homework. Look for and record examples of leadership principles, characteristics, and habits being modeled in your work environment or in other aspects of your life, be prepared to share these examples. Okay? And I did give you a handout, and that's written on the handout, by the way. Look for and record examples of leadership principles, characteristics, habits, being modeled in your work environment or in other aspects of your life, be prepared to share. Write a book report summarizing the second leadership book you chose to read and what you got out of it. Right? Give you a week to do that, read the book, write a report, report it to us. Write a personal vision or mission statement for you as it applies to your work in leadership role. Right? What's your personal vision for yourself 
of the next year, two years, three years. I want to be the top sales representative in this organization. I want to make seventy, eighty thousand dollars. I want to be put in a leadership position, right? Uh, over three to five years, I want to develop myself as a professional salesperson to the point I can run and own my own company. Whatever your vision or mission statement is, I'd like for you to begin developing that to express who you are, what you want, where you want to go. Does that make sense? What's next? Weekly basis next Friday. SLI sessions are recorded and you can listen to it uh, or view it more than once. Homework is an important part of SLI. For you folks who didn't get it done, uh, make sure you get it done. And a decision to become a leader becomes a lifetime journey of study and practice. See you next week.